again. <laughs> Praise God. How many Irish people we have in a church? Who is the Irishman? Raise your hand, Irishman. Yep. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. God bless you. If you get a chance to ever read up on St. Patrick, what a story. What a man of God he was. The way the Lord used him. Powerful, powerful stuff. But Reverend and Dr. Mike Caparelli is with us again this morning. His wife, Alicia, couldn't make it up this weekend, but we're so glad that you can. We've already booked next year in March. Same thing, Friday seminar, Saturday breakfast, preach 2025. If we're still on this planet, he's coming back next year, all right? Mike's asked me to play this video first, and when he gets up, you can stop playing, okay, Bruce? Go ahead and roll. An obsession video. with the devil, horror movies, and the occult. That's what motivated David Berkowitz to go on a random killing spree back in 1977 that terrified New York City, terrified the country. While in prison, the man once known as the Son of Sam became a born-again Christian. He spent 100 hours sharing his story with pastor and behavioral scientist Michael Caparelli. Gary Lane brings us more. 44 years ago, fear gripped the Big Apple as a mass murderer gunned down six people and wounded seven others. Describing himself as a monster, David Berkowitz leaves a note at a crime scene, taunting police to stop him. He signs it, Son of Sam. After a massive manhunt, police finally arrest Berkowitz based on an unpaid parking ticket. Berkowitz pleads guilty to the murders and receives 360 years in prison with no chance of parole. In the mid-1990s, Berkowitz professed to becoming a born-again Christian. He reflected on his spiritual transformation during a 1998 prison interview with CBN's Scott Ross. The scars of the past are always going to remain and haunt me, but I've given my life to Jesus Christ, and he has let me know in his word that he's forgiven me completely. Berkowitz explained he joined a Satanist cult before his murder spree and heard demonic voices directing him to kill people. Fast forward to 2022, when Pastor Michael Caparelli, a Ph.D. in advanced studies in human behavior, begins a case study on David Berkowitz. He conducts 34 prison interview sessions, a total of 100 hours with a man once known as the Son of Sam. Even as a child, I was fascinated with the occultic things, with the darkness, and it was affecting me. Now I look back and see, of course, it was all deception, and, you know, I, it, I captured my mind, but uh, and I regret that so much, everything that happened. But at that time, I was under that spell. I was under that power of, of evil, and you, you, couldn't, you couldn't bring it, you know, on. I was going down a path of self-destruction. Caparelli's experience and friendship with David Berkowitz is detailed in the new book, Monster Mirror. Well, the author of Monster Mirror, Dr. Michael Caparelli, is with us now. So what, why David Berkowitz? What, what, what fascinated you about him? I think it began for me at 17. I was incarcerated. I gave my life to Christ. And from that day forward, uh, my heart was bent towards those in prisons I knew, uh, I knew what it was like to be behind bars. Uh, I knew how receptive I was in that moment to the gospel. Heard David Berkowitz's testimony in the 700 Club back in the 90s. Wow. And uh, I wrote a, wrote a book a few years ago, a prior book, mailed him a copy called Dr. Jesus about mental health issues from a biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. And because I was both a clergyman that had an understanding of the supernatural as well as a PhD in behavioral science, David thought that it would be a, 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 I'd be a good person to tell the story to be able to elaborate both on the psychological and the diabolical. Well, let, let's get into the diabolical with David Berkowitz uh, um, following his arrest. Good. So good to be back here. David's story is uh, truly a miracle. The clinical community says that the psychopath is irredeemable. The data shows they make very little progress in therapy sessions. Uh, once a psychopath, always a psychopath. But the power of God to transform the most cold-hearted individual into really a man of great compassion, empathy. I mean, I've sat with David. You might ask, how do you know it's not a jailhouse conversion? That's a legitimate question. Uh, he's been a Christian for 35 years. It's hard to put on an act for 35 years. And uh, I've not only seen his actions, people can put on an act. 
I've seen his reactions. And reactions is a better litmus test for character than actions because reactions are actions under pressure when you're caught off guard, taken by surprise, when he got angry. Um, I describe it in the book. I know many of you have already read the book. If you could do me a favor, if you read it, please go on Amazon today and leave a review. It just helps the exposure. Um, my goal is to get this book in the copy, or a copy in the hands of every juvenile inmate in the country. Uh, right now, all 250 inmates in Cook County, all 250 juveniles in Cook County have a copy. Uh, New York City, Orlando, Atlanta, uh, no Alaska's next week. Uh, and right now, you have an opportunity to put a book in the hands of one of the juveniles in Worcester, juvenile detention. Uh, Beth McGlory, who's one of the supervisors, she's agreed to put the book in the hands of all 30 inmates. Uh, so if you want, afterwards, it's like a $17 commitment. I can show you, there's a link, a QR code uh, right on the table. I can show you how to sponsor an inmate. I can tell you that when I was behind bars, uh, you know, when all the distractions were removed at 17 years old, it was prime time to hear the gospel. So I, I'm believing this book is going to, going to reach the teenagers, the youth of our country. There are 13 mass shootings a week in the United States of America. School shootings, mall shootings, and the gospel is, is very much the only remedy for the human condition. Amen? I love your pastor. I don't know why he brought me here on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, bring the guinea on. You think you bring me on St. Joseph's Day. Right? Well, I'll, I'll roll with it. <laughs> I love your pastor and his wife. They have class. I don't know. You do. You got class. I don't know if you can teach that. Um, but they, they have class. They, they are the kinds of people that exchange evil with good. Uh, your past is a meek man. They've gone through many trials, and they have uh, stood the test and have proven to be good shepherds. How many are grateful for Pastor Gary and Pastor Janice? Amen. And the Dolstroms, some solid people. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> How do I get this? All right, yeah, so please keep that in prayer, the inmates. I do have a few books available for you afterwards. Uh, you can get a copy of Monster Mare, the hardcover copy. It's exclusive. Dr. Jesus, which I mailed to David Berkowitz. It's on mental health issues, surviving feelings. Uh, Pen Your Pain in the Parables is about recovering from trauma. The Ox in the Ass is, for those of you that have been yoked to asses, this is a great book. <laughs> Comes right out of Numbers 22. It says, don't yoke an ox with an ass. And then you can get a T-shirt. Uh, the paperbacks are 15. The hardcover's... 20, get a t-shirt for 15, it says, but for the grace of God, so go I. So before you judge David Berkowitz, before you point your finger at anyone, just know that but for the grace of God, so go I. Amen? I do have a word for you this morning. You can open up your Bible to Luke 18. You know, I, I'm a PhD in behavioral science. I not only minister to the church, but I'm a voice in the therapeutic community. And I got to tell you, America is leading the way with mental health problems. But yet we have more therapists and more psychotropics than any nation in the world. Something's broken. One of the things I believe is broken Dr. Jordan Peterson has really confronted this big time. I spent a few minutes with him a, a few weeks ago, put my book in his hands. He's reading it, uh, considering me as a, on his podcast. Please pray for that. He's got quite the reach. But he's challenging the, the clinical community because the clinical community has spent a lot of time dealing with people's emotions, and we are emotional, and dealing with our relationships, and we are social, and dealing with our thought life, and we are rational. But the clinical community has not addressed the moral makeup of mankind, that we are moral. We are moral beings. We're not just emotional. We're not just social. We're not rational. We're also moral. What does that mean? That means if we're not right with God and right with our neighbor, we're not right with ourself. And I think if anything Dr. Peterson has done in the last 10 years is he's married together psychology with morality. 
And listen, if you're going to a therapist and it's all about your emotions, it's all about your thoughts, it's all about your relationships, but that therapist never confronts you about your moral responsibility, change therapists. Because all they're doing is treating you as a victim. Jesus did not die for victims, he died for culprits. And we are a society of victims, so the gospel doesn't mean much. Because we see ourselves as victimized. I got news for you. You do more damage to you than anybody could ever do. You're the greatest abuser you know. There's no greater perpetrator. There's no greater predator in your life. Listen, you may have been abused by dad, mom, uncle, a teacher in school, a bully. The greatest damage done to your soul is the damage that you do. Your moral responsibility. And we're morally wrong. We're emotionally wrong. It's not a popular message. Now listen, you're expecting the mental health guy to make you feel good, right? Like, he's a mental health guy. I'm going to feel great. He's going to cure me of my low self-esteem. Some of you, some of us, let's, uh, probably all of us, our low self-esteem is just good common sense. There's something in us that knows we're not deserving. We're not deserving. There's something in us that knows we're not good enough. We're not good enough. If we were good enough, then Jesus Christ would have never had to die on a cross. Now, this is not a popular message this morning, but I'm going back to the basics today. I will allude to mental health, but I want to go right back to some of the basics because, listen, the gospel is not for victims. The gospel is for culprits. Is anybody willing to admit I'm a culprit? Okay, open your Bible to Luke 18, verse 10. If you can stand with me for the reading of God's word. I love bread of life. I love the fact that truth is preached uncompromised in this church. This is a church of deliverance. It's a church of healing, of salvations. We pray for miracles in the sanctuary this morning. It's easy for me to preach this way when I know the pastor and his wife are in agreement with the gospel of miracles. Let there be miracles this morning. The greatest miracle, a miracle of salvation, that our soul will be made right with God. Bless this word, we pray. Luke 18 says this, starting in verse 10. Jesus tells the parable. He says, two men go to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, and the other is a tax collector. Now, the tax collectors were the scoundrels of society. The tax collectors were hustlers. A tax collector, he's got what it takes to take what you got. They're not beloved people. The Pharisee stood by himself, and he prayed. He said, God I thank you that I am not like other people. I'm not like the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers. I'm not like the pedophiles, the psychopaths, David Berkowitz, the serial killers. I'm not like those other people and definitely not like the tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tithe of all I get. But the tax collector, he stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. He beat his breasts and he said, God, have mercy on me for I am a sinner. And Jesus says this. He says, the second man, not the first man, he walks out of the temple and he walks out justified. That's a key word, justified. Let me tell you, you've been justifying a lot lately, haven't you? We justify because we need justification. We're going to look at that word justified. We're going to see how it applies to all of us with the guilty conscience this morning. Bless this word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. These uh, two little boys, Frankie and Mario, Oh, okay, it's, it's St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Danny and, and Jimmy. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Frankie and Mario. Frankie and Mario were two troublemakers in the neighborhood. 
caused a lot of trouble, just a lot of riffraff, about nine, ten years old. Mom and dad reached their wit's end, decide they're going to visit the local priest. He has a reputation for reforming bad kids. And she brings the first child, Frankie. Frankie meets with the priest, and the priest has his typical protocol. He's trying to awaken the conscience of the little troublemaker, and he says to Frankie, he says, Frankie, he says, where is God? Frankie doesn't say anything. The priest asks the question a second time. He says, Frankie, he says, where is God? Frankie doesn't say anything. Third time, the priest gets upset. He makes a fist. He pounds it against the table, and he says, Frankie, where is God? Frankie gets up. He runs out of the priest's office. He storms home. He runs into his closet, locks the closet door. Mario opens the door. He says, Frankie, he says, what happened? He says, Mario, we're in trouble. He said, God went missing. They think we did it. The Bible says the wicked flee, though no one chase after them. I want to talk to those of you with a guilty conscience, or to use the phrase we use in society, a heavy conscience. A heavy conscience will take a toll on your mental health. I sometimes wonder, 251 psychological disorders listed in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the DSM, I wonder how many of the psychological disorders are rooted in moral makeup. I wonder how many are rooted in either fear and in some cases, guilt. Because when you're guilty, a heavy conscience it weighs on you. Your stress levels go up. Your GABA levels go down. GABA is your calming neurotransmitter. You can't sleep at night. Now, you might be saying to me, I sleep fine. I, I must have a good conscience. Well, there are two reasons why you sleep fine. Either you've got a good conscience or a bad memory. Some people sleep good because they've got a bad memory. But a heavy conscience is more than just a metaphor. Princeton University did a study. They took two groups of people. They asked the first group. They said, please recall one ethical decision, one act of generosity you've made over the last month. They asked the second group. They said, please recall one unethical decision, one immoral blunder you've made over the last month. And they asked both groups to predict their body weight on a piece of paper, they put all of them on a scale, and they found that those that had recalled an unethical decision, those whose consciences were plagued with guilt, had predicted themselves to be heavier than those that recalled an ethical decision. It's heavy. Somebody say, it's heavy. We have an inner prosecutor, a voice of accusation. And we do whatever it takes to gag that voice. We do whatever it takes to gag the guilt. But you're not just gagging the guilt. The Bible says in Romans 1 that that voice inside of you, the voice of conscience, it's the very Ten Commandments. God took his finger, he etched the Ten Commandments on the tablet of stone, and he engraved the Ten Commandments into your very heart. You're not just gagging guilt, you're gagging God. I mean, all, listen, I, I, I've done much counseling in my life, though I don't do any counseling anymore, so please, you know, if you need counseling, I'm pretty much going to give you a referral to somebody else, amen? Got burnt out counseling, I just can't, couldn't do it anymore, couldn't hear the same issue over and over again for 10 years. But a heavy conscience, somebody's plagued with guilt, that guilt will take a toll, it'll take a toll on your self-esteem. But we do whatever it takes. People justify. They rationalize. They come up with all sorts of excuses to rationalize their sins, to put, come up with rational lies. Lies that sound rational. Now, I try to teach my kids. I got four kids. When they were young, I taught them not only how to do the right thing, but I taught them, because they're my kids, and I know they got my genes, and I know they're going to be up to a whole lot of trouble, <laughs> I taught them not just how to do the right thing, but how to do the right thing after you do the wrong thing. Right. How to repent. 
If you can't bear forth the fruit of the Spirit and you fall short of love, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, if you can't bear forth the fruit of the Spirit, at least bear forth the fruit of repentance. Amen? Amen? So I told my kids, I said, listen, when you apologize, offer an apology, but don't rationalize. An apology without an addendum. Don't say, I'm sorry, but... Right? I'm sorry, but I'm sorry I, I laced your meatballs with laxatives. But you were getting on my nerves. My daughter did this to me, by the way. She confessed this at 27 years old. She's 30 now. She said, Dad, I got to admit it. Remember the Thanksgiving? You kept going back and forth to the bathroom? So I put laxatives in the meatballs. So I, I taught my, my kids. I said, offer an apology without an addendum. Don't justify, don't rationalize. My daughter Olivia takes a grapefruit, she's about eight years old, and she hits her older brother in the head with the grapefruit. So I said, Olivia, you're not going to the market, I'm not taking you to the mall, I'm not taking you shopping, until you sit down and you write your brother an apology letter. So she sits down, she writes an apology letter. As a dad, I'm so proud. She's bearing forth the fruit of repentance. She folds it up. She puts it under her brother's door. Now, I'm a little bit, you know, curious. I kind of want to see what she says. And here's the letter she writes her brother. Daddy told me to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you big butt cheek. Not love, Livy, from Livy. Now, we, we justify. What, what, I, what I want you to see in this parable is that there are two men. And these two men are two parts of who we are. They're two roads. They're two possible paths. The first man, he's the Pharisee. The first man, he justifies his sins. The second man, he's the tax collector. His sins are justified. I'm not playing with words. It's not a game of semantics. There's a big difference between you justifying your sins and your sins being justified. As long as you're justifying your sins, you're not guilty. You're pleading, I'm not guilty. But when you say, Lord, have mercy, I'm not pleading, Lord, I'm not guilty. I'm pleading, Lord, guilty as charged, have mercy, as long as you justify your sins, your sins are not justified. But when you plead, Lord, have mercy, your sins are justified. Now, they're in the temple. Understand, when you walk into the temple, we see this pattern in the Old Testament. You've confronted God's holiness. Every emblem in the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, all of it is in, in, it's putting on blast the holiness of God. And the outcome of that is this. When you confront God's holiness in return, he confronts your heinousness. His holiness puts on display your heinousness. You can't step into a well-lit room without every blemish being put on blast. The Old Testament, men step into the holiness of God. They come undone. What does the first man do? When his sins are on blast, he justifies. It justifies through two arguments. Let me say arguments. That's your spiritual warfare. You've got to cast down arguments. All that nonsense in your head, all the rationalizing, all the lies that are rational, all the justifications that says, I'm really not that bad. What I've done, listen, it might be bad, but it's not that bad. The, the, the justifications that the Pharisee gives, they put him far away from the cross. And I really believe that all the benefits of the cross, his mercy, his grace, even healing and deliverance, none of it can be experienced for those that are justified but only those that say, God, I'm guilty, justify me. Are you hearing me? So can we deal with some of these justifications this morning? Any lawyers in the house? Raise your hand if you're a lawyer. Oh, we got a lawyer. We need some lawyers in here, amen? <laughs> lawyers know how to justify. In fact, if you, if you got to hire a lawyer, you want one that's like half saved, half still in the world. I'm sure you're fully saved. But it's good to get one that's half saved. All right? <laughs> they know how to justify. 
This man, he dies, he's rich, he loves his money, sits down with three of his friends. He says, look, you know how much I love my money? He says, when I die, he says, I got three mil cash. He says, I want you to bury me with the three million. I'm giving you each a million dollars. Well, the day after the guy's funeral, the three friends go out for coffee. The first friend says, man, I feel guilty. He says, I kept the mill. The second man says, I feel stupid. He goes, I buried him with the mill. The third man's a lawyer. He's quiet. He ain't saying anything. Lawyers don't say more than they have to. And the two friends look at him. He goes, well, what's yours? You feel guilty or you feel stupid? He goes, neither. He goes, how'd you get out of that? He said, very simple. I wrote him a check for a million dollars. We justify, don't we? The doctrine of justification is God makes every wrong right. That one of the desires of the human soul, it's why we spend so much time when we commit a wrong, we don't just commit the wrong. We explain how what we did was wrong is not wrong but right. We justify because the need of the human soul is a need to be justified. And either you are justifying yourself this morning and you're saying, Lord, I'm not guilty, or you're saying, God, have mercy, and God's going to justify you. Now, i got to wonder, when you experience the true benefits of the gospel. Not only do you experience salvation. When I got saved 27 years ago, I was not only saved from my sins, but I wept so much. There was such a, a sobbing, a repentance, and there was such a cleansing of guilt that you know that when I got saved, the depression went too. And I got to look back and wonder how much of the depression was that albatross of guilt and shame. How much of, and I'm not saying all depression is moral based. Some of it is just bad neurotransmitters. Some of it is just bad chemistry. I get it. I understand the human brain. But I also understand that you and I are not just emotional. We're not just social and physical. But we are moral. And if I'm not right with God and I'm not right with man, then I am not right with myself. The psalmist said, he said, when I kept silent over my sins, when my sins were a secret, when I carried the weight of my iniquity, he says, my bones, they ebbed away. I couldn't sleep at night. He says, when I worked all day, I was exhausted like a man whose strength was sapped by a hot sun. He said, I was exhausted for one reason, because of my iniquities. So we got to wonder. How much of our mental health issues is rooted in our moral makeup? Now, I'm, I'm finishing Fyodor Dyeski's classic book, Crime and Punishment, written in the 1890s. The book is telling the story of a man who gets away with a crime. He gets away with it. He gets away with murder. He gets away with it legally. He gets away with it socially, but he doesn't get away with it morally. Nobody gets away with anything. It's called crime and punishment because the first couple of chapters describes the crime, but the rest of the book describes the punishment. And in the words of St. Augustine, sin is its own punishment. So even if you're never found guilty before the judge, even if you're never found guilty before your peers, you got to look at yourself in the mirror, and that albatross of guilt and shame, it takes its toll. This morning, my prayer is a revelation of Calvary, that your sins are forgiven, and your conscience is cleansed, and your soul is delivered. Nobody gets away with anything. Maybe you've been rehearsing and rehashing all the sins of the past. And you justify it. Let me ask you, you justify it. Have you gagged the guilt? How's it working for you? It doesn't work. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That only what Jesus, listen, Jesus was punished for you on Calvary so you don't have to punish yourself. In fact, there are people here, you've been cutting yourself, there's been self-harm. At, at, at the cross, all self-harm ends. He took the beating for you, he was punished for you so you can stop punishing yourself. That impulse to punish was satiated at the cross. How much of depression is self-punishment? 
How much of it is us punishing ourselves for the sins of yesterday? Now, I want to talk about these two justifications because this Pharisee, we think of the Pharisee as somebody else. Hello? The Pharisee, there's a potential Pharisee inside all of us. Oswald Chambers has a great quote. He said, the Pharisees of yesterday, they would point to the tax collector and say, thank God I'm not like that tax collector. He said, the Pharisee of today points to the Pharisee and says, thank God I'm not like that Pharisee. There's a Pharisee inside all of us, a justifier, a rationalizer. There are two ways he justifies his iniquity. When he's standing in the temple, his hideousness, his heinousness is on blast. His sins are found out. Have you ever been found out? I mean, your sins are put on display. I mean, we live with the fear of being found out. Many of us in the sanctuary, you're afraid that one moment somebody's going to come along and they're going to find out about maybe your problem with porn. They're going to find out maybe about the affair you're having. They're going to find out maybe about the money you're pilfering. And we live with this fear of being found out. And then we step into the presence of God. We come undone. And now we have a choice. Either we're going to justify the sins or like the tax collector, we're going to say, Lord, I'm guilty, have mercy, and the sins are going to be justified. Are we seeing this? I love the Bible. The Bible, I read it, and it reads me. The greatest psychology textbook ever written. It deals with every dimension of man, social, emotional, moral, and the Pharisee, he justifies his sins two ways. The first is by compensation. Compensation, to work for something. What he's basically saying is he's saying, look, I might, I might sin, but just so you know, I got some bad deeds, but I also got some good deeds too. He says, I fast and I tithe. And what I'm hoping for is I'm really hoping that my good deeds will offset my bad deeds. Oh, you think it's a Catholic problem? It's a human problem. Oh, the Catholics are all about good works. Listen. This is a human problem. It goes back to Adam and Eve in the garden. There are just as many Pentecostals as Catholics. There are people everywhere, even outside the church, that every time you're nasty, there's an impulse to be nice. And usually the nicer you are, the nasty you are, because you're hoping your good works will offset your bad works. And by the way, when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, the weariness he speaks of in context, it's not because you've been working so hard this week at a job that doesn't pay you right. The weariness is because you've been working so hard to cancel your bad works with good works, and you're not working from grace, but you're working for grace, and you're thinking the fasting and the tithing and the church attendance, well, somehow it'll cancel out. It'll nullify the iniquities if you were good enough then Jesus would have never had to die on the cross. I'm not saying don't fast. I'm not saying don't tithe. But we don't fast and tithe for grace. We fast and tithe from grace. And that weariness of the soul, that exhaustion of the psyche that we're constantly trying to somehow compensate for the mistakes of yesterday. Every mother in here, you know exactly what this feels like. You did your child wrong and you spend 20 years trying to do right to make up for the wrong and you're looking back at the past and God is saying this morning, you are forgiven. But you've got to call it what it is. He's not come for the healthy. He's come for the sick. He did not come to save the victims. He's came to save the culprits. Now, the Pharisee obviously didn't open the scroll. He didn't read the words of Isaiah because the prophet Isaiah made it clear 700 years prior to this passage, he didn't say that your bad deeds are filthy rags. He said your good deeds are filthy rags. Listen, it's one thing for the coach to say to the athlete on a bad day, you're bad. It's another thing for the coach to say to the athlete on his best day, you're bad. God is not saying to me, Mike, on your bad day, you're bad. He's saying your best 
works. He goes, I know you think they're great. I know you think you're a martyr. I know you think you give without any uh, ulterior motive. But I'm telling you, you've evaluated your actions, and I see the intentions. Listen, when we say God sees our heart, we should be a little bit more humble in saying that. Right. I, well, God knows my heart. That should scare the heck out of you. Because he sees not just action, he sees intention. You're grading yourself based on action. He's grading based on, man sees the outward appearance. The Lord sees the heart. There's no such thing as pure altruism. You always, listen, you love yourself so much, Jesus used the love of self as the golden standard to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. <laughs> we know how much you take care of yourself. How you take care of yourself, love your neighbor that way. You didn't need a command to love yourself. There's no imperative given for you to love yourself. There's a command for you to love God. There's a command for you to love your neighbor. It's used as a standard to say, as you love yourself, because we already know we all take good care of ourselves. It's like, I thought that this was going to be a feel-good service. This is, the, this is the mental health guy. Listen, that kind of therapy is killing people. It's just killing people. Everybody sees themselves as the victim of somebody else. And because of that, everybody's sick and stuck. No one's receiving. Few people are receiving in therapy. Few people that are in therapy are receiving the full counsel of God. That we're not just great winners, but we're sinners. And the greatest damage we do is the damage we're doing to ourselves. Am I helping anybody? Now, the second argument, well, you know, let me, let me say this about this first argument, about this compensation deal. We're working, we're constantly working. We find ourselves exhausted. This goes beyond just Christian people. This is the human condition. Adam and Eve did this in the garden. They mess up, and now they're sewing fig leaves together. They're hoping that they can hide the iniquity by something pretty, by something natural, nature. We're, we're looking at something good to hide something bad. That's been happening since the very beginning. It's the human condition. When David Berkowitz sat, I sat with him for 34 sessions, I said, Dave, tell me about the crimes. Very difficult for him to discuss the crimes. The man has experienced true God sorrow, usually it's with great distress that he unveils what happened in those two years. He says, Mike, I'd go out at night, 1230. He says, the caliber gun was in the glove compartment. I'd get out of the post office at midnight. He says, I'd go hunting through the streets looking for a victim. At the same time, I had in my trunk an emergency kit just in case somebody was stuck, I could help them. January 1977, it's winter. A group of girls, the car is stuck in a snowbank. He gets out. He helps the girls pull the car out of the snowbank, gets in his car, and goes looking for a victim. David, how does it make sense of this for me? I'm trying to feel like a man. I'm trying not to lose all the vestiges of my humanity. I'm doing bad things, but I'm hoping at least a couple of good things will somehow cancel out the bad things. Listen, I, this is a human problem that you and I, we think we can work for grace. That's why the epistles is so full of doctrine concerning salvation by grace and not by works because there's something in us that says, I've been bad, but please let me work it off with service. And man, is that exhausting. By the way, if you've got some family members that are pretty astute and savvy, they pick up on that guilt trip pretty quick. They make a slave out of you. Some of us got kids that do this, amen? Kids, kids, are, kids, kids are manipulative like, like two, three years old. I know you think he's cute with his little dimples and, you know, his you know, bat and eyelashes and all that, but she's a little manipulated at three-year-old. You don't got to teach kids how to sin. You got to teach kids how to be good. You don't got to teach kids how to lie. You don't have Lion 101, uh, Head Start, some class, some textbook they get on Lion. You need to teach them to tell the truth because we're born not so much winners. We are born sinners. Billy Graham's winking at me right now from heaven. This is probably as Billy Graham as it gets this morning. 
But you know what? It's a message. It might be an ancient message, a timeless message, but it's a message that's very needed in a day and age of humanism where we believe we're wonderful. And we come up with separate categories for people like David Berkowitz, psychopath, antisocial, because it's anomalous to our perspective of mankind that we are wonderful people. Listen, we are suffering from delusions of goodness. Delusions of goodness. Humanism has destroyed this culture. Carl Jung said it right. Carl Jung said a man must bend over backwards to look at himself. A lot of effort to look at ourselves. It's much easier to monitor everybody else. Much easier. Second argument. The justification of competition. He basically says, I'm bad, but I ain't that bad. How many times have you tried to gag guilt? You feel guilty. You did something wrong. You shouldn't have did what you did. You found out. Somebody confronts you. Or maybe just you. You know what you did. And you got to look at yourself in the mirror. And the way you gag that guilt, the way you silence that inner prosecutor who sticks its long, bony finger at you and accuses you day and night, the way you silence the accusation is you say, I'm bad, but I ain't that bad. How many have done this? Comparisons. Listen, we make upward comparisons and we make downward comparisons. This particular verse in this passage, the Pharisee is making a downward comparison. He's comparing himself to the worst possible offenders and he's saying, I'm at least not that bad. Some of you, you make uh, uh, upward comparisons. You look at people up. You look at people on social media. By the way, social media, it's showing that the rates of mental illness are high among social media users because we're constantly making comparisons. They say a picture tells a thousand, speaks a thousand words. A picture tells a thousand lies. You think they're always that happy? Do you know what they were doing before they said, smile for the camera? Smile! 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 Here you are on Facebook looking at someone else's life. Usually the picture they put up, they went through about 400 pictures to figure out the best picture, right? Okay, so you're, you're judging the ideal, you're judging you, the real you against the ideal them. You're judging the you, you wake up, you got bags under your eyes, you look in the mirror, ah, who's that? And now you're judging that against some filtered Botox, some fabricated, some not real person. How many times have you met somebody in person? You only knew them on social media and you go, I, I don't know who you are. I wonder, I mean, maybe this brings a whole new meaning to Jesus saying, I never knew you. I never knew you. <laughs> well, who are you? Where did you get those lips? That's not the lips I ordered. I did not order those lips. It was about four sizes too big for your face. Oh, I know, I know. This is bad. I might, yeah. He already booked a date for next year, so it's... He didn't book the date next year. I might not go this far. But in our passage, the Pharisee, he's making a downward comparison, not an upward comparison, a downward. He's looking at the worst among them, and he's saying, look, he goes, I, you, you got me. I'm a sinner, but I'm not that bad. How many have seen the movie Tell the Truth Now? Maybe we'll, we'll say we saw it before Salvation, Scarface with Al Pacino. Huh? Well, in that movie, right, he's a thug. Listen, there's no high. You can point your finger at him all you want to, but at least he's not hiding the fact he's a gangster, he's a drug dealer, his name is in the newspaper, he's sitting in the restaurant surrounded by the morally fastidious, he stands up at his table and he looks at them and he says, you need people like me. So you can point your finger and say, that's a bad guy. He goes, what's that make you, a good guy? No, you know how to lie. He says, me? I always tell the truth, even when I lie. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's right here. That's what's happening. Is we're, we're saying, we're saying, I'm bad, but I'm not that. Now, you listen, you may have a cousin, sibling, 
somebody in your family that can't ever get it right. Maybe they keep going to Team Challenge. They keep relapsing. And by the way, you're, you say you're praying for them, but there's sometimes a secret satisfaction we get that there's one scapegoat in the family and we're the hero that we can say, at least I'm not as bad as Cousin Ed. At least I'm not as bad as my sibling. And God is saying this, look, you, you, can, you can say that maybe you're free of drunkenness, but pride is the mother of all iniquity. People aren't proud of being rich. They're not proud of being clever. They're not proud of being good looking. People are proud of being richer, cleverer, better looking. It's the comparison. It's the element of competition that makes one proud. C.S. Lewis says this in Mere Christianity. As we look at somebody else and it gives us this elevation, we almost get a satisfaction chewing the fat, talking about others' problems, others' misdeeds, the sins of other people's lives. It gives us this, this satisfaction, and God sees the arrogance of our hearts, and it's really a justification. It's our way of hiding our own iniquities. That justifying, it doesn't get rid of the guilt. The only thing that will wash away your sin, that will cleanse your conscience, not what you did, it's what he did. The premise of my book, Monster Mirror, really, i got t-shirts that say this. It really comes from a statement that was made in the 1700s back in England when they would publicly execute a criminal and the entire town would come out and they would throw rocks and spit and they would call that man a scoundrel and every name in the book in front of his family. One man named John Bradford stood up, stood up tall in the midst of the public arena, in the midst of the town square, he pointed to the criminal, said, there but for the grace of God, so go I. You see a monster, I see a mirror. You see some other guy, I see me. There are no other people. There are no other people. Other people will shoot up schools, not my kids. Other people will commit homicide, not me. Oh, you don't think there's a psychopath in you? Let, let, me, let me give you this challenge. Spend six months brooding over every resentment. Spend six months beating yourself up. Spend six months isolating from community. Spend six months justifying every wrongdoing you do. You will be shocked at the kind of person that you evolve into. The heart of man is wicked and deceitful above all things. I know it's a hard message. But as Shakespeare said about the character in The Temptest, he said, the man was cruel to be kind. And this morning, this message, cruel to be kind. Because the one thing missing in therapy today is tough love. Not the love that hugs you, but the love that slugs you, that when you're wrong, not the love that kisses you, an enemy will kiss you, but a friend, a faithful friend will slug you. I need the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life because when I'm not right with God, I'm not right with myself. And to get right with myself, I got to get right with God. Now, I believe some of us this morning, the imperative of this message is we've got to change our plea. When David Berkowitz was arrested in 1977, the lawyer said to him, pretty simple, he said, look, this is easy. He said, your plea is pretty simple, not guilty by reason of insanity. So we can get the judge, the jury, all day long to agree with that. Your, your crimes were deranged. You've got writings on the wall in your apartment saying that little killers live in the hole. He said, some of the letters that you sent, it shows a deranged mind. David Berkowitz was going along. The plea was not guilty. Many of us are constantly pleading not guilty. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he meets with this lady. Her name was Ali, an African-American Pentecostal minister from Staten Island. She would go to the prison, minister to him. And the authorities said that she, he walked into the room with Ali and she was ministering to him. They were holding hands. They were singing hymns. God was touching him even early on, even before he got saved. And he walked out of that meeting. The lawyer was outside the door. He looked at his lawyer and he says, I'm changing my plea. I'm guilty. I know exactly what I was doing. We're going to change pleas this morning. Worship team, can you come up?
either you're going to justify or you're going to be justified. Hallelujah. It is real easy to spend the rest of your life monitoring someone else. That's, that's the easy road to take. It's the more often traveled road. I mean, it's like by virtue of our anatomy, our eyes are pointed outward, not inward. It's just, it's just a lot easier for us to be looking at everybody else. Let's see what everybody else is doing. If I read another post on Facebook that says, the church needs to, you're the church. real easy to spend the rest of your life monitoring your husband, monitoring your wife, thinking, oh, man, this message is a good message. I wish so-and-so was here. Wish, can we get the CD? Eat the scroll. Eat it. It's for you. It's for you. It's for me. Now, sometimes it's hard. It's, it's just hard to square off with what we've done. The weight of it. I mean, I, I told Pastor Gary this the other, the other day, you know, actually it was Jonathan I told this too. I said when I was pastoring, I had a staff, about eight or ten people on staff. And I said when people get convicted of what they've done, that is a very precarious position that they're in for them and for us. Because either A, they're going to own it, and they're going to fall on the sword. They're going to say, I'm wrong. You're right, I'm wrong. I, I shouldn't have did that. They're either going to fall on the sword or if they're not willing to fall on the sword, they're going to draw the sword. And they're going to make you the enemy. They're going to project their guilt towards you. But you didn't handle it right. You, well, when you came up to me to point out the fact that I robbed the church last week, you, that your tone wasn't right. You spin it. It's called spin doctors. Any spin doctors in the church? It's so hard for us to square off with what we do. I mean, we, we just have this tendency. I mean, Nathan knew this when he was approaching David. He's about to confront David. He knows, look, this is either going to go very good or it's going to go very bad. Either I'm going to tell the king, look, you're the man. You did this. You're the man in the parable. You're the guy that committed this crime. Either I'm going to say, you're the man, and he's going to say, yes, I'm the man, or he's going to say, off with Nathan's head. Where do you think the phrase, don't kill the messenger, comes from? Because when we get guilty, we either accept the guilt or we get angry. Blame is a cover-up for shame. We draw the sword. Now this morning, I want to fall on the sword. I want to say, God, I'm guilty. I'm going to be like the tax collector. I'm not going to be the Pharisee. I'm going to just beat on my chest and say, God, guilty is charged. I'm changing pleas this morning. Guilty as charged. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You are going to experience the mercy and the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ. I won't be surprised if anxiety goes, goes out the door. I won't be surprised if depression ends today. I won't be surprised if your soul is mentally restored because it's been morally restored. It won't surprise me in the least. Stand up with me. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. I know you wanted a hug and you weren't expecting a slug. <laughs> we'll give you the hug after. But if God's been convicting you and what I've said, anything I have said, the Lord has put a spotlight on something I've said and said, this is you. You're the man. You're the woman. I want you to come to this altar. Hallelujah. I'm not going to give a lot of altar calls. You have one opportunity, you can get right with God. And I, I'm going to believe as you get right with God, you're going to get right with yourself. Anxiety is going to go out the window because fear has to do with punishment. It has to do with I'm expecting to be punished for what I've done. I know it's not an easy call to, call to answer. I know. Listen, you've got to swallow your pride. I promise you, if you swallow your pride, you're not going to choke. You won't choke. Somebody say, I won't choke when I swallow my pride. You're not going to choke, I promise you. It's going to take some humility to say, I'm the man. 
I'm the woman. I'm tired of looking at everybody else. I'm tired of whitewashing it. I'm tired of rational. I've been living with guilt for so long. He's come for the guilty, not the innocent. I love that line in Shawshank Redemption. He said, everybody in this prison is not guilty. <laughs> what a picture that is of society, isn't it? Are there any tax collectors in the house? Hallelujah. Any tax collectors that are willing to say, Lord, I'm guilty. Hallelujah. Quit hiding behind your husband's problems. Quit hiding behind your wife's problems. Quit making a scapegoat out of somebody else. Jesus. God is wrestling with you. He is wrestling with you. This is not, every time I preach this message, I never get the response I've gotten from messages of yesteryear. Never. Because it's humbling. Man, it, oh goodness, it crushes the ego. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh God. Hallelujah. Depression is going to go today. Anxiety is going to leave. Blood pressure is going to go down. The mercy and the grace of Calvary right now. The mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Guilty as charged. 